Both players and Wizards of the Coast saw Pokémon as an unbalanced and broken game. With Imposter Oak's Revenge, Rocket's Sneak Attack, and the Rocket's Trap, alongside powerful draw cards like Bill, Erica, and Oak, players going second were lucky if they got to keep any cards in their starting hand. The Prop 15-3 format was a failure. Players weren't interested in playing a format where games still came down to drawing Oak, or Computer Search to find Oak. Japan still would not let Wizards balance the game with a banned and restricted list. But the franchise was about to enter its second generation, and big changes were on their way, with new Pokémon, new types, and new trainers to salvage the game. Most importantly, a hero was on its way from the Johto region to save players' hands from Team Rocket's disruption tactics. And it was cute, small, and pink. I'm the Ruby Retro Historian, and this is the story of the Eek heard round the world. By the end of 2000, players felt the game they had grown to love during 1999 was in shambles. The format was overrun by fast, hard-hitting basics like Erica's Jigglypuff, backed by decks chock full of disruption trainers that made the game unrecognizable from its early days, and well, just plain unfun. Luckily for them, the Neo World Order had arrived. Neo Genesis, the first expansion featuring the new Johto Pokémon, arrived on store shelves in mid-December of 2000. The set would add over 100 cards to the game, many of which would prove instrumental to saving it. Perhaps the biggest change Neo Genesis made was the introduction of Dark and Metal Pokémon to the game. Skarmory and Steelix were the first Metal Pokémon released in the TCG, and were backed by Metal Energy, a new special energy card that, besides the obvious effect of providing energy for their attacks, also reduced damage by 10 to any Pokémon it was attached to, not just Metal Pokémon. The drawback was it reduced damage dealt by non-Metal Pokémon by 10. However, this actually made Metal Energy stronger than Defender for Pokémon who took recoil damage from their attacks, like Chansey's Double Edge or Rocket Zapdos' Electro Burn. Metal Energy worked in two parts, reducing the damage dealt to itself by 10, and then reducing damage taken by 10. So for every Metal Energy attached, recoil damage was reduced by 20. Confusing? Oh yeah, but powerful? Without a doubt. More powerful, however, were the first Dark Pokémon released, Murkrow and Sneasel. Murkrow's first attack prevented the opponent's active Pokémon from retreating. No, not just during the next turn, but for as long as Murkrow was your active. In combination with Feign Attack, which could snipe the bench, Murkrow could just trap a useless Pokémon active and then snipe around it, decimating your opponent's board. For as great as Murkrow was, it was nothing compared to Sneasel. A 60 HP free retreating basic that resisted Psychic, Sneasel's second attack made use of the new Darkness energy, dealing 20 damage for each successful coin flip for each Pokémon that you had in play, including Sneasel. When you consider that Darkness energy added 10 damage to Pokémon's attacks, you know Sneasel was dishing out huge damage with Beat Up. That said, Darkness Energy was no good on non-Dark Pokémon. You see, it dealt 10 damage to them in between turns, softening them up for your opponent's attacks. It should be noted that the Dark Pokémon from Team Rocket and eventually Neo Destiny would also be immune to this recoil damage. But enough about the new types. The set also released a new kind of Pokémon, the Babies. 
A baby Pokémon was a 30 HP Pokémon that could evolve into its grown-up form, like a normal evolution, but carried the baby rule that required your opponent to win a coin flip to attack when they were active. Otherwise, their turn ended. Pokémon clearly wanted to slow down the pace of the game, and this was a great mechanic to do it. What's so interesting about the babies is that wizards, for unknown reasons, added text to the top of the English cards that weren't present on the Japanese cards, stating baby Pokémon count as a basic Pokémon. You can clearly see the absence of that text from the top of the Japanese cards. So, for purposes of the Japanese game, baby Pokémon were not intended to count as basic Pokémon. That's why so many subsequent cards like Broken Ground Gym, Dual Ball, and even this unplayed Aquapolis Slowbro mention baby Pokémon in a manner separate from basic Pokémon, despite the fact that it's redundant for us English players. Several Japanese documents state that baby Pokémon are treated like basic Pokémon for X reason, but they never said it counts as a basic for all purposes like Wizards did. The only time the text was made all-encompassing was for all Generation 1 cards. Babies didn't exist, but the term basic on those cards was intended to be all-encompassing for babies, so you could use a card like Good Manners to search for a baby Pokémon. Did the choice by Wizards make a difference during the Neo era? Mm. Maybe? The only card release that would seemingly function differently between the languages was Stantler from Neo Revelation. Its terrorize attack only affects basic Pokémon, with no secondary clause referring to baby Pokémon. Yet, Wizards only has a compendium ruling related to its obviously worded second attack. Fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately for Stantler, this card was completely unplayable for the entire time it was legal. Anyways, moving on from that nerd fest, Neo Genesis gave us four baby Pokémon, all of which were highly playable. Pichu did 20 damage to each Pokémon in play with a power. Magby shut off powers, and Elekid dealt 20 damage through a Pokémon power as a bench sitter, instead of attacking. But best of all was Cleffa and its Eek attack. Allowing a player to shuffle their hand back to their deck and draw a fresh seven cards, Cleffa was one of the best Pokémon of this era, if not throughout the entire game. There was no need to rush through your deck for disruption cards when your opponent could just eek into a new hand. As Scott Gearhart put it in his review of the set, if you weren't playing for Cleffa, well, it better be because you just don't own that many. Card availability was definitely still an issue, as we'll see in several deck lists in just a bit, but players were definitely striving to run as many of these pink little guys as they could get their hands on. The introduction of Cleffa saw players return to Lass as their primary means of disruption. The idea was to use Lass and try to catch your opponent off guard without a Cleffa of their own to refresh their hand, then use your own Cleffa to set up your board before they could respond. Baby Pokémon were a clear attempt of the game designers to try and right the wrongs of the degenerate nature of many of the game's first cards, and quickly became mainstays in decks. But that's not the only way Pokémon corrected its errors. Many of the trainers from the set were direct attempts at fixing the meta. Eco Gym was another shot to try and nerf energy removal cards, but instead of having to discard cards from your hand to play an energy removal like no removal gym required, the discard and energy just went back to the owner's hands. Notice that it makes sure to exclude all colorless energy, so special energy like double colorless, potion energy, and full heal energy couldn't be recovered by this effect. Time Capsule restored any combination of five Pokémon and basic energy to the deck. Well, a stronger recovery effect than Nightly Garbage Run, its user couldn't play any more trainers for the rest of the turn, and it also benefited your opponent. Speaking of supporter-like effects, Professor Elm was the first good hand refresh trainer, but it also carried that same supporter-like limitation. Sorry, Sabrina, your gaze might be strong, but you just don't compare to the raw power of Elm, where every time you play to Sabrina's gaze, you're actually just going minus one from your hand. Anyways, Pokémon clearly knew Professor Oak was strong, so they printed a nerfed version of it to try to slow down players from flying through their decks. Sprout Tower directly countered powerful colorless Pokémon like Chansey, Wigglytuff, and Erica's Jigglypuff by reducing their damage output by 30. Double Gust provided a gust of wind effect, but allowed your opponent to gust one of your own benched Pokémon as well, meaning players had to be cautious in playing it when they had heavy retreat Pokémon. 
Yet, in decks with only free retreaters, like so many Sneasel-centric lists, this was definitely the gust effect to run. In addition to these solution-oriented trainer cards, Neo Genesis also saw the release of Recycle Energy, which, upon being discarded for any reason, was recycled back to its owner's hand. Not only did this mean energy removal cards couldn't discard it, but neither could KOing the Pokémon it was attached to or discarding it to pay a cost, like attacking, retreating, or even using it to play your own super energy removal. But that's not to say these were the only impactful non-Pokémon cards in the set. Energy Charge allowed players to shuffle back special energy cards. Well, if you could flip heads, that is. We'd have to wait for Special Charge to get an actually good special energy recovery card, but that was still years and sets and generations away. Super Energy Retrieval allowed the player to discard two cards to retrieve four energy cards, a huge boost for Rain Dance builds. It's too bad we didn't receive this card during Rain Dance's heyday in the base to fossil era like Japan did, but I digress. What's important to note is that we actually received the nerf version of this card. Japan weakened the card in its original Neo printing to allow the player to only recur basic energy, not simply energy as the original printing stated. And that's probably a good thing given all the special energy cards now in the game. Neo Genesis also introduced players to a new type of trainer card, Pokémon Tools. Modeled after the held items of gold and silver, these were trainer cards that came into play attached to a Pokémon, and were discarded when consumed or by some other card's effect. Though the set released four tool cards, only two were impactful to the meta, Focus Band and Goldberry. Focus Band further slowed down the game by forcing the player taking a KO to hope their opponent flipped tails. Otherwise, the Pokémon Focus Band was attached to survived with 10 HP, and then Focus Band would be discarded. If you kept having flips go your way, in theory, you could just keep putting Focus Bands on your 10 HP Pokémon, stopping your opponent from ever taking a KO. Focus Bands on baby Pokémon became the norm, forcing opponents to have to win multiple coin flips to take knockouts. Goldberry helped Pokémon tank hits, healing 40 damage in between turns before being discarded, keeping Chansey and Rocket Zapdos relevant while providing power base decks a counter to the newly released Pichu. With the release of Neo Genesis, it appeared to players that the game was finally getting its act together, and that its best days lay ahead. However, Wizards Translation Department dashed those hopes entirely by making one of the biggest translation errors in Pokémon's history. Dating all the way back to base set Clefairy, Wizards had an extensive track record of mistranslating cards. Those errors ranged from Team Rocket Grimer, whose poison gas attack should poison, not put the defending Pokémon to sleep, to the ridiculous misprint on Blaine's Charizard's first attack, directing the player to discard fighting energy, then clearly referencing fire energy later in the attack's effect. Oh, and the attack also cost fire energy, making this an even more ridiculous misprint. Given the decentralized nature of the game at the time, Wizards deemed it easier to play cards as printed, which begs the question how you play Rocket's Minefield before the corrected printing, but I'm not here to discuss how many damage counters go on a newly benched Pokémon. No, I'm here to talk about the card that destroyed any diversity the base to Neo format hoped to achieve. I'm talking about... Slowking. If played as the Japanese creators intended, Slowking is a mediocre card at best. Its first attack is, well, pretty bad for 3 Psychic Energy, only having the chance to inflict increased damage and confusion. When active, it forced the opposing player to win a coin flip to play a trainer card, otherwise it returned to the top of that player's deck. The problem? Wizards left out the clause from its mind game's power about Slowking having to be active. Played as printed, Slowking became one of the strongest, most oppressive trainer floodgates ever printed outside of straight trainer lock. Why? Because if not limited to the active slot, the power stacked. A player could have four Slowking on their bench and force their opponent to win four coin flips to play a single trainer card. The probability of getting to play a trainer card with four Slow King in play is six and a quarter percent. Even with two in play, it's 25 percent. And as a stage one, Slow King was easier to get into play than the trainer locking Dark File Plume. 
It's easy to see why Slow King dominated the trainer-dependent game and stifled any creativity Neo Genesis promised. In fact, the card is so broken, most modern players returning to the base to Neo format enforce erratas on all mistranslated cards to salvage the format from Slow King's iron grip on the meta. When you do that, base to Neo becomes a fairly diverse, flip-dependent, yet still playable format. But that's not what happened at the time. Wizards said, we print it, you play it, and so players did. And because this is the history of competitive Pokémon, well, that's the format we'll be looking at. One of the earliest lists we have is Joseph D. Kileda's Zap Trap list, featuring Rocket Zapdos and many of the powerful hand disruption cards that ruled the previous format. That's not to say he didn't play some new cards, including Goldberry and Sprout Tower, but it's clear players still needed some time to both open the new cards from boosters and get acquainted with how powerful many of them were. Thankfully for competitive players, the next Super Trainer Showdown was not scheduled until late June, so they had plenty of time to acquire and realize the power of the Neo Genesis cards prior to traveling to the tournament venue in New Jersey. The qualifiers would again occur on different weekends across the country, but instead of being run as several single elimination tournaments, each age division played in one tournament, competing in best of one Swiss rounds with the top eight cut receiving invites to the Super Trainer Showdown, and the top two winning paid trips. Based on some reports, it seemed Top Cut had finally shifted to a best two of three format, but others indicate it was still only a best of one. That's the trouble with some of these old forum reports. The details are just lacking. Well, anyways, before we dive into the qualifiers, I want to point out the fact that Wizards was no longer offering paid trips to those in the 15 and up division. Well upset about the decision, these players were honestly fortunate to be able to participate in the qualifiers at all. In early 2001, Wizards announced that it was doing away entirely with the 15 and up division under the guise of Pokémon being a children's trading card game. What they probably were trying to do was push these players into their longer enduring, less fad-like game of Magic the Gathering. However, immense pressure from the player base resulted in Wizards relenting and reinstating the 15 and up division. At least for the time being. Anyways, enough with that doom and gloom, let's take a look at some of the decks that found success in the qualifiers. The first ever Canadian qualifier was held in the middle of April, but was ironically won by an American, Drew Jacob, playing a deck reminiscent of Haymaker, chock full of strong basics like Sneasel, Ditto, Rocket Zapdos, and Gligar. Gligar is a neat little addition to Haymaker decks, and was an easy replacement for Hitmonchan given its free retreat, fighting resistance, and chance to poison. Interestingly, he only ran two Cleffa, no energy removals, and opted for sneak attacks over last disruption. It was still early in this format, so I'll let it slide. Besides, at least he had Eco Gems to counter opposing removals. What makes Drew's tournament run so compelling was the cheating issue he faced during it. His top eight opponent, and only loss on the day in Swiss rounds, was not actually who he said he was. Presumably playing as someone else to earn them their STS invite, this player was disqualified and Drew continued on his tournament winning run. Invites were for real trainers only. No Masters of Disguise allowed here. Sorry, ditto. Maybe next time. The following weekend in Florida, Chris Magner took second place with a deck list he deemed stale donuts. And boy, was it stale. Harkening back to the days of the gym era, Chris's deck ran all the powerful cards from 2000, including a whopping four Erica's Jigglypuff. As you can imagine, he won a few of his matches from first turn pulled punches alone. While he only ran one card from Neo Genesis, that being Cleffa, Chris's strong placing demonstrated that while Neo Genesis solved a lot of the problems caused by the first generation cards, it certainly wasn't going to be a cure-all. Clefable experienced a resurgence during the qualifiers, thanks in part to Metronome being a great answer to opposing Sneasels and Neo Genesis gifting players a new Clefairy with 50 HP, 10 more than its more frail base set printing. Check out this list that Chris E. used to go 7-0 with the San Jose Qualifier. His list is all in on beating Sneasel decks. Just look at the inclusion of Ditto, which could copy Sneasel's beat up for one double colorless energy. 
This meta call definitely paid off. Chris defeated an opposing Sneasel deck on the first turn of the game during Swiss rounds, and in the finals against a Sneasel deck that featured Rocket Zapdos and Wigglytuff, he used Ditto to KO an opposing Sneasel, flipping three out of four heads on beatup to take the game. Man, I wish I had Chris's luck when Aaron and I play this format. I can only flip Tails, Tails, oh yeah, and more Tails. I'll get you one day, Aaron. Not a chance. Clefable also did well in Wisconsin. Devin Peltier Robson took down the qualifier with this version, featuring Wigglytuff and Gligar. He went heavy on energy removals, which to me is a bold move considering the release of Eco Gym, but in a room filled with Sneasel and old fashioned haymakers, the decision definitely paid off for him. His only loss on the day came at the hands of the dreaded Slow King deck. Maybe if he ran more than two Cleffa, he would have been able to refresh his hand and play around mind games, but given the success he had in a qualifier in a room containing many of the best Midwestern players, including Jason Klusinski, well, that certainly speaks volumes. Speaking of Slow King, players were finally catching on to how broken the mistranslation made the card. Check out this list that Daniel Stringham ran at the Utah Qualifier. Clef account aside, this list is pretty close to what players settled on as the best way to run Slow King. With strong basic attackers like Sneasel and ways to heal Slow King from Pichu's zap attack, it's easy to see why Daniel did so well at this event. He didn't drop a single game, defeating all matter of Sneasel variants. While he didn't play out the finals, instead opting to split the prize pool with his friend, Daniel had a great run, going 8-0 up to that point. Slow King decks did well at various qualifiers during May. Here's a list from Daniel Gracie, who got third at the Arizona qualifier. Finally, a list running for Cleffa. People were finally realizing how deck building in this format needed to go. This variant focused on sheer aggression, running Bill and Challenge to rapidly draw cards, focus bands to save Sneasels, and last to try and catch opponents off guard before refreshing his own hand with Eek. In Texas, this Slow King list took second to, yeah you guessed it, another Slow King deck. This list is probably the closest to the modern version people who play without the mind games errata are used to seeing. Running Murkrow to snipe and Brock's Mankey to try and trap opposing Slow King active, this list is incredibly strong for the time, and it's obvious why it plays so well. The one standout in the list is Misty's Wrath. In a resource preservation format, it seems a bit aggressive to be running this card, but clearly expensive discards serve this player well. One thing was clear, Slow King was everywhere, and if you wanted to do well, you either had to beat it or play it. That's not to say the entire tournament scene was filled with decks focused around Slow King and the new Neo cards. For example, at the Nevada qualifier, this throwback Haymaker list took second, running limited counts of new cards and opting for a tried and true strategy, big basic Pokemon. Fossil Magmar is definitely an interesting choice given how many free retreaters existed in this format, and that definitely showed when this player's loss in the finals came at the hands of a Sneasel deck. It's at this point that if this were any other video, well we'd conclude discussing the qualifiers here and continue on to covering the ensuing Super Trainer Showdown. However, this is where the format timeline diverges a bit. That's because in April 2001, still seeking to fix the trainer-centric game, Wizards announced the new modified format, which would be used for that year's STS events. This decision separated the game into the Base to Neo format and the modified Team Rocket On format, rotating out Base Set, Jungle, Fossil, and Base Set 2 from legality and competitive play. Thus, the annual rotation that players would come to love and hate was born, marking the end of the broken Base Era card's time in competitive play. That's not to say that players didn't keep experimenting with the base to Neo format. Each set gave archetypes additional tools to continue developing lists. The rest of this video will discuss the cards each set gave us relevant to the no errata, historical base to Neo format, and what final deck lists emerge from them. But don't worry, we'll plan to cover the first STS of 2001 in our next main series video. 
The second Neo expansion, Neo Discovery, was released in early June 2001, but wouldn't be legal until July 1st because of the upcoming STS. Including non-holo versions of many holo rares, this set contained the smallest number of new cards of the Neo era, and as such introduced few important cards. This set saw the release of two more baby Pokémon that would become immediate staples, Iglybuff and Tyrogue. Like Elekid, Iglybuff had no attack, but instead came with the Power Gaze, which shut off opposing Bench Sitter's powers until the end of your turn, directly countering the mistranslated Slowking. The irony was that the game designers didn't intend to counter Slowking at all, but instead made Iglybuff to deal with bench dwellers like Aerodactyl and Dark Vileplume, as Slowking was supposed to be active for its power to activate. Tyrogue offered a chance to one-hit KO opposing baby Pokémon. Though it only carried a 25% chance to KO, Tyrogue's release caused players to be more careful with protecting their baby Pokémon with focus bands to force the opposing player to win a total of three coin flips to take knockouts with Tyrogue's smash punch attack. Unknowns D, M, and N provided players protection from darkness, metal, and normal attacks respectively, although these cards were also mistranslated and were really supposed to only protect your unknown, not every Pokémon you had in play. This mistranslation resulted in Chansey's increased viability as an attacker in this format. Lastly, Fossil Egg provided a way for players to cheat powerful fossil Pokémon, like Aerodactyl, into play without needing access to a mysterious fossil. This would be incredibly helpful in getting multiple Aerodactyl into play, as once the first one was put onto the bench, its prehistoric power prevented other mysterious fossils from evolving. Later that summer, the Southern Islands promo collection was released in the US, featuring 18 beautiful promo cards, whose artwork come from postcards that were included with the box set. While none of the cards released were meta-changing, they provided players with more options for which version of a Pokémon they wanted to run in their decks. Players still playing Wigglytuff now had a Jigglypuff featuring a Gust effect. Ivysaur and Wartortle gave players additional versions to include over their base set printings. However, most impactful was Onyx, which gave Steelix players a much-needed boost to their decks. Featuring 90 HP and an attack costing only a double colorless energy, this basic Onyx was the one to run. The only other Onyx that players considered running was the Neo Genesis version with its Rage attack, but to access it required using other cards like Recall or the yet-to-be-released Aerodactyl from Neo Revelation. So you were better off just running the one with more HP. Because of the release of Neo Discovery in the Southern Islands collection, we have a few updated deck lists we can bring you from the end of the summer. Kenneth Barber combined the newfound power of Steelix with Slowking, ultimately going 5-0 and taking down a local Unlimited tournament. The list feels a bit disjointed and unrefined, running lightning attackers in conjunction with Steelix. There are no recycle energy, and only limited means to deal with energy removals, but given that most players had moved on to the modified format, unrefined lists like these would become the norm for base to Neo. A more interesting deck is Cena Gaziaskar's Brock Sandslash list, presumably teching Magmar to handle Steelix decks like the one we just saw from Kenneth. I honestly have no notes for this deck, other than the inclusion of Magby or Tyro could prove more effective than Gligar, but Gligar does provide a free retreating poison option for one energy, as opposed to the two energy cost on Sandslash and the lack of free retreat. This is definitely one of the most unique takes on the format. But my favorite concept from this summer period is Blastoise Fear Alligator, or Blastgator, combining the might of the two water titans into one clunky, really fun deck. Running many strong draw cards to fly through the deck and find the pieces needed to get out its attackers, and even making use of Trash Exchange to power up Fear Alligator's Riptide attack, this deck is a versatile option for the era. Shout out to Jason Klasinski, better known as Ness and his deck garage over on Pojo, for attempting to refine this water-heavy archetype. Shortly thereafter in September, Neo Revelation was released, printing the first Ho-Oh and Legendary Beast cards, none of which would be overly playable in the base to Neo format. The only impactful cards from the set were the trainer's Balloonberry and Healing Field. 
Balloonberry was a powerful tool card that acted as a payment to retreat a Pokémon instead of discarding the necessary energy to do so. Healing Field gave every deck a boost, allowing players to heal 20 damage from their active Pokémon. In an era when so many Pokémon had no retreat cost and you could retreat as many times as you wanted per turn, it was easy to send up a damaged Pokémon in an attempt to heal it. Players just had to be careful when they played Healing Field because it could benefit your opponent as well. Near Revelation also saw the release of the iconic Shining Pokémon mechanic, which would appear again in Neo Destiny. Though neither of these initial prints were playable, Shining cards featured basic forms of evolved Pokémon, boasted attacks with outrageous energy costs, and were limited to one copy of that particular Shining per deck. It's pretty obvious why these things made no impact on the overall meta. But speaking of cards that did shift the meta, Pokémon Tower was released as a League promo in January of 2002. Originally part of Japan's vending series released during Generation 1, Pokémon Tower prevented players from recurring cards from their discard pile to their hand. This immediately boosted removal heavy and stall decks, stopping recycle energy from recycling to its owner's hand, energy retrievals from retrieving energy, and item finder from finding useful trainers. But players had to be careful. If they misplayed an activated item finder or energy retrieval while Pokémon Tower was in play, they still had to pay the card's recursion cost, even if they couldn't reap its benefits. February 2002 saw the release of the final Neo set, Neo Destiny, which saw the return of the Dark Pokémon for the first time since the Team Rocket expansion, while also introducing their light counterparts. While Dark Pokémon had low HP and high damaging attacks, Light Pokémon had higher HP, but weaker attacks, often aiding all Pokémon in play, not just your own. For the purposes of the historical base to Neo format, this set really didn't contain many impactful cards, continuing the trend of the prior two sets. Unfortunately, the vast majority of the featured Dark and Light Pokémon weren't even borderline playable because of Slowking's mistranslation but a few would show up in decks now and again during the end of the Neo era. Light Dragonite's Miraculous Wind turned all special energy cards into colorless, effectless energy when active. In a format teeming with special energy cards, this power was incredibly strong. Light Golduck was an inclusion in Brock's Ninetales decks for its Core Blast attack, again continuing the trend of special energy hate. The trainers fared a bit better in the meta, Broken Ground Gym offered players a way to trap powerful free-retreating basics and babies active and force them to waste an attachment to retreat, even if it was usually just paid with a recycle energy. EXP All, later reprinted as EXP Share, saved basic energy cards from a player's KO'd active Pokémon, making energy attachments to Cleffa less impactful. Lastly, Energy Stadium provided players with a means to retrieve discarded basic energy cards, and it also served as a great counter stadium to cards like Chaos Gym, Eco Gym, and Pokémon Tower. During 2002, interest in the Pokémon TCG was nearing its low point, and Base to Neo suffered as a result. Much to the anger of the player base, Wizards removed the 15 and older division from organized play entirely in 2002, and those who could still play were focused on the modified format, as that's what all large tournaments were running, first using Team Rocket on, and then eventually transitioning to Neo Genesis on. Killer reports on Pojo declined to a mere handful of reports a month, and deckless quality suffered as well. Players just weren't putting as much effort into the game as they had a year before. Despite hitting a low point, we still have some base to Neo lists from the time to look at prior to the release of the Expedition set. Though the 2002 World Championships did not feature a 15 and up division for the modified format, it did offer a base to Neo Professor Cup. Alex Chuck Brousseau won the Professor Cup using Metal Chansey. While many lists we look at in these history videos are questionable, this list stands up to the test of time, only requiring adjustment if you play with the intended Japanese text on cards like Slowking and Unknown N. Using Chansey as an offensive tank, this deck capitalized on Unknown N and Metal Energy, reducing recoil damage Chansey took from its double-edge attack. 
The deck also ran three Igloo buff to handle opposing Slow King decks, resulting in Chuck being able to activate his trainer cards with ease. Unfortunately, we don't have many other lists from this tournament. We know that Chuck defeated Elaine Chase's Wigglytuff Sneasel deck to win the tournament, but that list is sadly lost to time. I wish we had it. I know a lot of modern-day Base to Neo players have found Wigglytuff to be a strong contender, so I would have loved to see how Elaine combined its power with Sneasel. Third place went to Heidi Craig's Rocket Zapdos build. Though we don't have that list either, I have to imagine it might have looked something like this list from PTCG Archive that runs Muck to counter opposing Slowking and a slew of removals in Pokemon Towers to disrupt opponents by discarding their Recycle Energy and preventing the use of Item Finders. Metal Energy protects Rocket Zapdos from its Electro Burn attack, and Strong Draw and Search options help power up a fast Zapdos as well as provide early access to Muck and the deck's other disruption cards. This is an iconic deck of the Neo era, doubling as a great contender against Slowking variants. Fourth place went to Dakota Williams with Clefable, and while we don't have that list either, we can guess it might have looked something like Wilson Wong's take on the deck. Though this list is from December 2001, I doubt that the list would have changed that much with the release of Neo Destiny or any of the subsequent promo cards. The fact that there were so many powerful attackers in base to Neo that Clefable can use Metronome to copy those attacks for a single colorless energy made it such a strong option in this era, so it's not shocking that it would find its way to fourth place in this tournament. While we don't know if Dakota ran this many draw and disruption trainers, or if they opted for more tech options rather than a straightforward list, we do know that their deck decision was certainly a strong one. Jason Klazinski came in 10th with his Sneasel Slowking list, but you guessed it, we don't have that one either. To compensate, let's take a look at the Slowking Sneasel deck from his blog. Running a thick 4-4 Slowking line with a focus on Murkrow and trapping a Pokémon active thanks to three Gust of Winds and the Little Seen Pokémon Flute, this list is sure to lock down opponents with Mean Look and then Feint Attack them into Oblivion. Their switching trainers will be close to useless thanks to Slowking's mind games. While Brock's Mankey is another way to trap a helpless Pokémon active, it also serves as a guaranteed gust to drag up a Slowking in the mirror match and then trap it the following turn with Mean Look. By using Taunt instead of Gust of Wind, you didn't have to worry about trying to bypass mind games in the mirror match while getting off that powerful gust effect. This deck is completely diabolical. One Slowking list from the tournament we do have is from Escal Vestre, who played the deck to a top 16 finish. His list is interesting because it focuses less on Sneasel, opting to run multiple copies of Tyrogue and Murkrow instead. Additionally, he runs 4 Oak for early aggression, switch to avoid Slowking being tracked active, and Sprout Tower to counter Chansey decks. Notably, he runs no Goldberry to deal with opposing Pichu, which I imagine had to give him fits at some point during his tournament run. Another interesting deck from the top 16 is John Cimento's Rocket Zapdos deck, featuring a lot of unique choices like Lickitung and Trash Exchange. I suppose Trash Exchange makes sense considering he is playing the Energy Removal Pokémon Tower package, so item finders weren't an option, but you can't control what cards you're getting back versus discarding with its effect. Seems to me it might be a bit more of a fun option than competitive, but I definitely respect his creativity. Lickitung is also interesting, as most players had abandoned the tongue wrapping menace by this point to stall with baby Pokémon and Focus Band, but I absolutely love that it resurfaces here. Two lists that we're missing, but I really hope we see at some point, are 31st place Roy Robertson's Blissey deck and 33rd place Steve Perucha's Charizard deck. I can only imagine how fun these might be given the iconic nature of those cards. Some other iconic decks that we're missing include Sneechu or Dark Daycare, and Brock's Ninetales with Steelix. Let's take a look at the list from PTCG Archive to get a feel for each of these decks. Sneechu contains exactly what the deck suggests, heavy counts of Sneasel and Pichu. 
It also makes use of several other free retreating Pokémon and babies, running Brock's Mankey to trap opposing Slowking Active and Murkrow for additional ways to win the game. Because the deck is so low on Pokémon and energy, it has tons of space for consistency trainers, but that also makes it susceptible to Slowking builds and Chaos Gems. Brock's Ninetales can make use of several Pokémon thanks to its shapeshift ability, but the most iconic is undoubtedly Steelix to tank with metal energy and not be at risk of losing those energy to removals thanks to Brock's protection. The deck also makes use of Light Golduck for some added special energy hate. If you're wondering why the list runs 3 Iglybuff, the logic is the same as Chuck's Metal Chansey build. It was the best way to deal with opposing Slowking at the time. Though slower than much of the rest of the meta, and susceptible to Mag Beast Sputter, Muck's Toxic Gas, and Goop Gas Attack, the deck is still a staple of the era. With the end of the Professor Cup and the upcoming release of the E-Series cards, the Unlimited format quietly faded from tournament play, not resurfacing until the last few years, where most players choose to play with the Slowking Errata, believing it creates a healthier, more diverse metagame containing more viable decks like Dark Crobat, Kingdra, and even a stalling Blaine's Charizard list. Despite its serious mistranslations, the Neo sets propelled the Pokémon TCG into the future, saving the game from disruption trainers and bringing balance to Generation 1's broken game state. While you can certainly argue that coin flips in the form of baby Pokémon and Focus Band weren't the floodgates we needed, they definitely allowed the game to last beyond the opening turns to become a battle of resources reminiscent of its origins during 1999. This conclusion isn't the end of our exploration on Neo's impact on Pokémon history, but merely the beginning. We still have the TCG's first rotation to discuss and the ensuing Super Trainer Showdown that would finally see beloved Stage 2's reach glory and Sneasel relegated to the ban list. But that's a story for another episode. Honestly, episodes plural. There's so much of the game's rich history for us to cover, even from this early era. Until then, let us know in the comments who your favorite Stage 2 Pokémon is. And while you're there, be sure to like and subscribe so we know you're enjoying the content. We want to take a moment to thank our patrons for their continued support. If you're interested in seeing sneak peeks of upcoming videos, as well as other benefits, consider becoming a patron today for just a few dollars a month. All of the support any of you give us goes right back into the channel to continue to improve our videos. Also, if you haven't already, be sure to join the Ruby Retro community on our Discord server. This is the Ruby Retro Historian signing off and bidding farewell to Sneasel. Sayonara, kid. We hardly knew ya.